Welcome back to another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown. And today we are pleased and honored to have our guest on for the second live edition of the show in 2022. Uh, as I said in our first live edition, uh, in 2021, I was diagnosed, well, I was battling cancer and the outpouring of support and the outpouring of support that I received from this great community of Calgary was overwhelming. And in 2022, I wanted to give back in the way that I could. So we decided that we were going to try and raise some funds for some great community organizations here in the city. And today I am pleased to welcome uh, on for her kind of first time on the show, but second technically because she was on the Ward 3 debates that we did hold. And that is Ward 3 Councillor Jasmine, Jasmine Mamian. Thank you so much, Councillor, for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Hey, I'm so happy to be back in a way. Um, really enjoyed being on, on your debate shows during the campaign and uh, excited to chat today. So, Councillor, before we get started, I want to talk about the organization that we've chosen for this or, uh, for this interview to give the 50% uh, of the ticket sales to go to, and that is Vivo. So, for my listeners, for people who are listening to this later on, who is Vivo? What is Vivo, and why did you choose them for the organization that we wanted to give uh, the proceeds to? Well, for those Word 3 listeners who are knowing or, listen, or listening, they will know um, that uh, uh, Vivo is the rec center in Word 3. And uh, right now it's actually undergoing a massive expansion that is um, supported by all three levels of government uh, to uh, better service the area because uh, we've really outgrown uh, Vivo. And it's been an amazing uh, sort of flagship within the community in terms of, of bringing people together for all different types of events. Um, the NHC Community Association lives there. Um, there's a, a pool and, and uh, obviously gyms and that kind of thing. And it's been a really amazing space for in terms of cultural center as well. Um, and it really just has, has gone way too small and so we're really excited that that vivo expansion is, is well underway and uh that this money will go to support that initiative and all of the good work they do in terms of bringing play hubs right into communities um and so i'm really passionate about what uh, vivo does in terms of helping get people put to play especially not just children but adults as well i think that's one of the things coming from a sport background that i wish uh, we did a little bit more of is is have adults play as well as kids and um that's certainly within uh, the spirit of vivo and and uh, so I'm really happy we were able to support them. Awesome. Uh, for those who are listening, for those who are watching, uh, we will be announcing the the total fundraised for this event, for this uh, live episode of the show later on in the episode. So stay tuned. Be sure to keep on watching until the end because then we will be announcing how much we did raise. But I want to start off talking about you because that's what you're here for, to talk about uh, the counselor. Um, I... I've usually asked this question for every for all politicians that have come on the show. I didn't get the opportunity during the election campaign to ask you this, but I'm going to ask you right now. Councillor, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? That's such a good question to start start <laughs> interviews with. So I'm so glad glad that you do. Um, I think for, for myself, uh, like the, the values of, of the family in which I was raised certainly have influenced that. And um uh, you know, having an immigrant parent, there's certainly uh, always this uh, conversation about what are we doing to give into community, to be part of community. Um, and my mother was also a nurse. Um, so her her long career in healthcare of, of helping people, I think, certainly shaped me as well. And then um, as much as, um, you know, be, being in a sport isn't exactly maybe the service in the, in the typical way, I think being, I was honored to represent Canada um, and uh, felt that that was certainly um, an aspect of, of giving back to community as, in the way that community invested in myself. And I think also just more broadly and philosophically, um, I just feel so privileged and lucky uh, to be born in Canada, to have a great life that I have. Um, I feel in many ways I have so many privileges and kind of was lucky to be born on third base in many ways. And so I think I have an obligation responsibility to, um, to give back and, and to uh, help, help make our, our society and our city certainly a better place. You you decide to give back in the political realm, in the political arena, and in your first campaign as a, a named candidate on the ballot, you won in Ward 3 on October 18th, if I'm doing my math here correctly and if I can remember correctly. Um, 
I want to talk about that night, the election night, because that is the night your life changes forever, because you are sitting there with the rest of Calgarians waiting for the results coming in. Can you say, take me through the process of polls have closed and now you have to wait for the results? What was going through your head at that time? Well, to be honest with you, it's it's unlike my experience in sport where everything sort of comes down to a singular moment where you either perform or you don't perform and, and all the training and everything leading up to that moment kind of gets tested in a campaign like the work is is really put in and then you sort of have to wait for the results and um, there's no performance element at that last second that can make it or break it. So from my perspective, it was way easier <laughs> to, to manage and uh and I felt like uh, myself and, and my team had kind of done everything that we had could have done throughout the campaign to win. And so I was just in a really good place about it. You know, if we won, we could feel good about that and 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 uh, start thinking about uh, transitioning into office. And in the event that I didn't win, I felt like I had still done something meaningful um, in terms of the connections that I made within the community. And so I was really quite at peace. Um, we certainly had a feeling that that um, it was going to go well because just of the work that we had done. And and we worked really hard in the get out the vote and knocked you know close to fifteen thousand doors. So we knew that all of the right pieces were there um, for, for it to be successful. And so um, I, I don't wanna say it was like completely a surprise, but certainly in the moment when it's finally like validated and it's the truth, it, it felt, felt really good. Um, and then I think, you know, you, you're totally right that from that moment on, like your, your, your life sort of changes forever because um, you're always gonna be um, for the next four years, at least you're, you're the city councilor. Um, and that's a huge responsibility for nearly a hundred thousand uh, residents that you represent. Um, and then uh, it's, it's a big shift as well as well for your family um, to go through. And even if you never run again after that, um, you'll always be the person that ran for, for elected office, as, as you know, right? Um, and so that is certainly something that that changes. Uh, it's an interesting job in terms of, unlike other types of jobs, it's, it's public service. So, you know, when you make a decision at work, uh, your neighbor wants to talk to you about it, or, you know, you walk in, down the street, people are going to chat to you about it. And it's a very public facing job, obviously. Um, and so that's a bit of a transition um, in terms of uh, just how you manage your public versus private life. But um, it's been such a joy um, these past few months. So I've asked this to many politicians from all three levels of the government, federally, provincially, and even municipally. At what moment did it sink in? Because you can always look at, okay, now I have to get my game face on. Now we have work to do. But it, was there a moment in the first 100 days, because we are doing this 100 days after your, the election, where you were able to sit back and go, it's real, it's reality. I'm actually the counselor for one of the greatest cities or if not the greatest cities in Canada. And I am making the decisions that are going to affect the day-to-day -day lives of every Calgarian across this city. Good question. Um, I don't know if there's a singular moment. I think one of the things in, in the first hundred days I alluded to this earlier, is you really have to gain a competency in sort of every single aspect of what a city councillor does. And, and it's, in that sense, it's everything from addictions and mental health to land use planning to um, transportation and transit, parks and recreation, uh, COVID-19 policy. I mean, like the list goes on and on. And so in, in that sense, it's like it's, it's the coolest job in the world because you can literally work on any aspect um, of our city that you'd like to work on and, and shine a light on. Um, but it's also a huge responsibility as well. And I think that there are moments um, where you sort of realize, okay, like this, like a lot is hanging in the balance here. Um, and, and that's a significant um, responsibility. But I, I can't say like there's sort of one moment where it sort of clicked for me. Um, I think that what I feel, I feel better and better every day. Like we're, we're always, we're learning more. We're figuring out how to how to get things done for people. We're connecting with residents more and more um, as as we are able to. And so, um, yeah, I'd say it's it's not a singular moment. Um, but maybe when I look back after four years, I'll have a pin, more pinpoints for you. Now, you you are one of the few people who were able to answer this question, so I'm going to ask it. Um, you are taking over a ward that you're the current mayor, Jody Gondek, Mayor Gondek currently used to represent so 
usually after an election, you meet with the outgoing counselor. You're able to do have that transition talk. Was that that was there a transition talk with Mayor Gondek to say here are the issues for Ward Three move forward? Or because she was transitioning into her new job, there might not have been that able that conversation to be held. So we still had the conversation, um, <laughs> uh, not not to worry. Um, we certainly did, and and uh, uh, the 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 best thing I think for Ward Three is that that institutional knowledge is still is still in the building. Um, and so to the extent that there's something that's happening in Ward Three that just has there's a lot of history on that file, I can pick up the phone and call her and ask her about that, and I do. Um, and uh, that doesn't always mean we land the same on the issue. Um, we're, we are different, different counselors and, and different elected officials in that regard. Um, but having that is, is amazing. And I, I think other elected officials still have that. Um, you know, I, I can think of for sure. I'm sure if Evan Spencer tried to pick up the phone and call Shane Keating, he would take the call. Um, and I, I know that that's probably true for for almost everyone. Um, when you leave this job, I, I can only imagine after four years or eight years or sometimes people stay much much longer. Um, you, you you want it left in good hands. You want there, that to be that good transition, even if you don't agree. So um, on all on all the pieces. So for for me, it was it was just fine and uh, ongoing. I'd say this council has accomplished a lot in the first hundred days. There are some issues that I want to dive into and get your opinion on and get your feedback on. Uh, one of the first things that I want to talk about, though, is the budget, because that is the biggest thing that you have had to kind of uh, pass within that first hundred days and not even the first hundred days, first month you are elected, you have to pass the budget. Now, you heard from the constituents across Ward 3 while you were running in that election. Were you able to take what you heard and bring it to the council table? Because this is a budget that was kind of implemented by the past last council. It is the spillover of last council's budget. Were you able to properly advocate and advocate and change something that Ward 3 residents were telling you about during that municipal election and bring it to the council table when budget deliberations were going on? Yeah, great question. I mean, it is very, very quick because you are um, doing the mid-cycle adjustments from the last year um, of the one Calgary budget. And so um, the idea that you can enact as much change as you would be able to at the beginning of a four-year cycle is, is just not the case. And you haven't gone through a strategic planning process yet with your colleagues. So the, the truth is, I don't I don't think anyone can enact as much change as they'd like to sort of at the tail end of, a, of a, the last council's budget. Um, but I actually think that's in some ways a, a good thing um, because you have now time to build those relationships within an administration to stress test your ideas when you come in. Because um, some ideas that we, we thought like would be really good things um, like just might not be feasible or, or might not be the right decision once we actually have all the information. And you can't always know all that, that right on the outside. So I think in terms of how it's staggered, it makes good sense. Um, I did bring forward a couple um, recommendations. I mean, one of them was around transportation making some strategic investments there and around transportation safety as well, um, which was something that I heard a lot about. Um, so I was really pleased with that. Um, we are making um, continued investments as well in um, in some of the equity and diversity initiatives that I think are really important for our city to take on. Um, and then also more investments in 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 our core services like police and fire. And those were also things that I heard um, consistently at the door. So I did feel that we were able to do that um, in this budget, but I certainly am excited um, to figure out how we can implement um, more change or um, just come, come together as a council actually in terms of our strategic priorities in the next little while, um, and then translate that further um, into, into the four, next four year budget. And I think there's also priorities that you can explore that don't always require like massive resources. Um, and so there's some of these small ball elements of, of things that I'm trying to work on right now um, with Councillor Penner, for, for example, we're trying to do some um, piloting around how do we better um, manage dog poop in parks. <laughs> um, it, it might not be a, a huge intensive cost at this point, but it's piloting an idea, trying it, and then um, seeing if, if, if it's something that's working, how do we find consistent funding for it in the future. Um, so that's a big thing. And I think the other thing that's really critical um, and 
it became very apparent to me since being elected, but but it was certainly something I talked to on the doors with folks, is that there just isn't a whole lot of municipal resources for things. And, and you have to, as much as possible, try to figure out what kind of provincial and federal money is on the table, um, and how do you make those big plays to, to make sure that you get things done for, for residents. And so in Ward 3, for example, we have um, the lowest amount of affordable housing out of anywhere in the city. And that's probably not something that people would suspect, like why Ward 3? Um, but, you know, making sure that we're not leaving federal money on the table, given that the federal government has some real um, uh, investments happening in there. So I think it's, it's a combination of all of those different things um, that you have to look into in a budget. And um, yeah. Now, I, I asked this to Councilor Penderby. She brought this up as well. Um, you were an elected official. Did you ever think that one of the topics that you'd be discussing and potentially finding a solution for is dog poop? Like I could just imagine that was not on the top of mind when you said, I want to make the city better. <laughs> what getting into politics. You know what though? It's it's funny because um I think that we often think of huge strategic or seismic shifts. Um, but that's actually not what residents are asking for. For the most part, residents are by and large satisfied with the strategic direction of the city, or they're usually more or less satisfied with, with the basic services that they get. Um, there's certainly some areas that they'd like to see more things happening. Um, and in Ward 3, we, we have some service deficits that we're trying to address. Um, but uh, you know, those small quality of life things are really important to people. Um, so yeah, like dog poop, who knew it would, it would be, um, so meaningful to people, but when you're walking down pathways or you're standing at a transit stop and there's a little garbage there and it's full of only dog poop, uh, it really bothers people and there's gotta be a better way that we can compost it. And, um, I, I don't know if Councillor Penner mentioned this, but the city of Calgary actually is one of the only municipalities who can compost dog poop. It's, it's something we have the technology to do. And so why don't we explore how we can better manage something like that? Um, I want to talk, go back to the budget here for a second, because this budget was very hard for some citizens to swallow because there was a tax increase in, uh, attached to it. Yet again, I know inflation happens. I know cost of doing service does go up and things, if we were all sitting where we were, we would all be living at 15 cents an hour minimum wage because things just don't change. But I want to talk about that budget because there are people who might say that a 3.88% tax increase was kind of hard to swallow. What was your reasoning behind voting for it or against it? Yeah, I think I think that, that it's true. It, it is, it's never easy. Like it's never popular um, <laughs> to raise raise people's taxes. But I think that what we haven't done a very good job of at the city, and this is again something I'm talking about, the strategic priority is showing people like where their dollars go and what that value for money is. Because it is if you just are like, yeah, my taxes are going up, but I don't like materially see any change in my community. That's really hard. Um, but of course, costs for cities do go up. Um, Three point eight eight percent is still um, um, uh, lower than uh, growth plus inflation. So um, that's one of the challenges. Um, I, I think that we have to do a better job of, and I did release a, a, a video about the budget right after to explain like what the investments were and why I thought that they were important. Um, and I had residents say like, you know, I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with this one, but I kind of agree with this one. And I think that's kind of all we can ask. I think if, if the notion is sort of like you, we never want want you to spend money. I mean, that's that it, we can't, it's the cost of doing business. And um, we, we do have to, we do have to make sure that we're, we're taking care of of, of the services that we provide as a city and, and that we're providing people that value. But I think as elected officials, we have an obligation to better explain to people um, what that money is going towards. So please go check out that video on my Instagram page if you'd like to. Um, and I think the other thing is the city itself, if you go on the website, it's very difficult for people to understand those city budgets. Um, and so those are conversations we're having right now strategically. And it's one of my sort of main goals is like, how do we better communicate to the everyday citizen about the value in which we provide. Um, because I, I did come in and had have some tough, tough conversations with administration so far of, you know, why is it that, you know, we, we do provide really good value in some ways, but citizens don't see that. And I want to give you one really good example, which is when the doors I was told over and over again, like, I just don't really know if, if the composting is worth it. 
Um, you know, I don't fill my compost bin and I just don't really think that that's a good use of money. Um, and I'm not, I could compost by myself and all these types of things. Um, and then I actually went in and learned a little bit more about our composting. And um, it's really actually quite miraculous what, what the city has been able to do in a short time. So we've significantly reduced, um, like the waste diversion is something like, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like 50% um, landfill diversion that we've done um, over the last eight years, which is pretty fantastic since 2016, actually, um, when the, and, and, and that, that uh, waste that is now being composted is is not only being being used for, for gardens and that kind of thing, but it is being trans transferred into renewable natural gas now, which is now a revenue stream for the city. So you've taken literal trash and turned it into revenue, which is by all accounts a very successful innovation story, but our citizens just don't know about it and they don't see that value. And I think that that's where the city oftentimes falls short is when we are innovating and we are doing different things for citizens, um, why don't they know about it? And if I was gonna start any type of uh, sort of video series, it would probably be like, why didn't I know that? Um, and, and telling people more about what I think that the city is doing to sometimes deliver value. And that doesn't mean there's, there's not a lot of places that we have to push, um, but I also think that communication is really important. And I think we come up short there quite a bit. Uh, just on that note, from one citizen to an elected official, uh, uh, overhaul the website because it is so hard to navigate that I get lost and I try to pride myself on knowing websites. I just get lost on a regular basis. So that's my two cents on that topic. Totally. Um, and I think your the website is so is such a good example because it's sort of like it's for every single possible type of user. But like there's some people who want to do business with the city, but then there's some people who just want to figure out how to compost something. Those are two very different um, needs. And I think you're absolutely right that sometimes we don't always uh, we think about all the services that the city provides as opposed to thinking about who's the user and how do we get them the information they need. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I want to go back here for a second because uh, a budget is a city budget. It's not a Ward 3 budget. It's not a Ward 10 budget. It's not a Ward 12 budget. It's a city budget. Working with your L fellow colleagues, how was the collaboration between you and your other 15 elected representatives who were working on this? Because you were put into a very small room very quickly, very tightly, like to pass a million dollar budget, almost billion dollar budget. How was working with them in a very quick turnaround time from being sworn in to passing a budget? I mean, it, it was great. I, I think we have a good council in, in the sense that we have, um, you know, different different views and people who are paying a different pay attention to different aspects of, of the city budget and of, of the strategic direction in which we're heading. Um, so, I mean, it did it did come up quickly, um, but I'm telling you, like we sat down, um, many of us, and we we're going through it, like with a fine tooth comb to try and make sure that we all understood and had questions answered. Administration was was very good at helping us understand that. Um, it's just the reality of how quickly those things come up. Um, so I think that the, in terms of engagement and and um, and the strategic direction and ensuring that those uh, priorities are are aligned with what this next council's strategic vision is is really going to happen this year in the coming months. Um, and in terms of of getting things things done, um, you know that that happens well before I think you actually even vote on the budget. Now, one of the other big things that was passed in the first, I think it was actually, if not the first major uh, thing that was passed, was a declaration for an emergency, a climate emergency within the city. Um, do you think this was a good first step for this council to do? You know, I think, um, again, like the, the council hadn't done any of its strategic planning to sort of say that, you know, what should be the number one thing that we do um, that that was brought forward. Um, and, you know, what I looked at was really the merits of, of what that climate emergency was about. And I think there was a lot of frustration about the word emergency. And I think that there was maybe um, not a real understanding of sort of who who it affected and, and what it actually meant. Um, and when you go and read it, I wish we could pull it up. Um, it, it's really about making making the corporation better aligned to make climate based and informed decisions. Um, and so from a governance perspective, when you think about a challenge like getting to net zero by 2050, um, you have to have the right information coming at you, you have to have the, um, the corporation, all the business units largely aligned. Um, and that's just something that uh, 
needed to have further council direction on. And I know that there's some some folks like setting aside, um, you know, climate science for a second, which I just want to be really clear that I do believe that man climate change is real. Um, but uh, setting that aside, um, I think that uh, from a governance challenge, if, if you have a long term uh, goal that you need to meet, um, if you do this with the organization and try and force them to make, meet that within the last five or 10 years, it's going to be very, very hard on consumers. It's going to be very hard on anyone trying to do business with the city. And so I think from a longer term strategic perspective, um, getting this climate piece um, sorted and, and better understood and in, integrated into our decision making is, is absolutely incredibly important. Um, politically, whether whether that was the, the right decision or not the right decision, I mean, I, I don't know if like that's not that wasn't I think the biggest consideration for most of us. I think we were really looking at the policy merits of of it um, and also just emphasizing I've had lots of conversations with constituents about it since um, and I always show it to them and I say like, you know, like I just want you to read it because I think the notion of climate emergency and what that means and what it actually materially means are two very different things. Now, you've mentioned a few times in our first half hour of this interview, the show, um, strategic planning. Now, I know we are in the new year. You're in your first full year as a sitting sitting councillor. Uh, what is your priority? What is not not let's let's not let's take the city out of the realm first off. Let's talk about councillor Mian, Ward Three councillor. Sure. What's your priority? What are you going to be bringing forward? Because you've heard from the constituents, they voted for you. What are your priorities to move this city forward? Because I think a lot of people are saying, okay. The last two years have been tough on this city for COVID-19. The last 10 years have been tough on the city because of oil uh, prices. We need mm -hmm. to move the city forward. So what are your priorities to help move this city forward? Yeah, great, great question. Well, I think there's a few things and I'll try and distill it down rather than just reiterating every aspect of, of my platform because I think that the, that can get a little bit, um, I don't know, too granular. I think if I were to really distill it, I would say, in Ward 3, people need to be able to move around easier and safer. Um, and so those the, that you can expand, really pedestrian safety was probably one of the biggest things I heard on the doors is, you know, I don't feel safe letting my kids out front. Uh, we have lots of issues with crosswalks. Um, the way that many of the suburban neighborhoods have been designed, they're very difficult now to retrofit, um, but very wide roads, um, not a good uh, uh, consideration really of, of the pedestrian realm and what people can walk to. So, um, you know, it, that that's really something that's important. Um, also move easier, right? So we um, prioritizing um, different types of modes of, of, of transit. So um, not just pushing for green line to come north in the BRT in the meantime, but also what does our pathway network look like? Like what are the, what are the challenges there? And those are certainly things that are our big priorities. I also think it's, it's really important that people are able to play more. Um, and one of the challenges was Ward 3 is that we don't actually have a park, a regional park. And uh, so that makes it very difficult um, to congregate around community or, or bring people together. Um, so another long-term priority, um, and I'm working on it already, is to try and get Ward 3 a regional park. Um, and I think the other piece that I would say is, is informed communication. Like that is something that I heard over and over again is like I just... You, people kind of hear the odd thing about the city, but don't really understand um, what's going on at the city or why decisions are being made. Um, and so trying my best to figure out what are what are the ideal ways to communicate with constituents. And so we're hosting actually our first uh, Q&A next Thursday, February 17th. Um, we're having residents send in your questions. Um, a lot of times people have the same questions. And if you email our office, we'll get back to you. Um, but a lot of times I think it would be great if I could just hop on camera and explain it like this. I also go on my Instagram story fairly regularly and try and explain to people like, hey, this is what's going on at council. Like this is what intergovernmental affairs actually means. Um, this is where we sit in council and why, you know, like just even the more, more basic elements of, of showing people um, how City Hall works, um, I think is really important because that's something I, I even wondered about um, a lot of those things. And I think when I when you think about uh, the average citizen and, and what they like to see and then sort of the, the behind the scenes and the sort of the documentary style like insights that you can get in now by watching Netflix or YouTube or whatever, people don't wanna just hear about what you're doing. They, they wanna see it. And I think trying to show people that is, is also a, a, big, a big piece for me. You, you talked about transportation, getting people around. It is a subject that's on a lot of people's minds right now because 
Uh, I think you probably know where I'm going with this, but the Green Line is a big infrastructure project. You sit on the Infrastructure and Planning Committee on at City Hall. Um, people of Ward 3 want that Green Line to extend up to your ward. Uh, but the cost of Phase 1 is already ballooning because of inflation, cost of services. How do we get this done? How do we get the green line to go up to Ward 3, to get that transportation, to get people moving, to get pedestrian safety? How do we get it out as a priority? And how do we get it done with the cost of goods and services getting out of control? Well, the best day to build a green line is like 20 years ago. <laughs> um, but the next best time to build a green line is is right now. And I think I think that this, this is a, a real challenge. I mean, it, it, I regularly took the bus downtown and, and I can tell you, I often wondered why is there not a green line already? Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a project that will only get more and more expensive as, as time goes on. And I think fundamentally, it's one of the shortcomings of our city is that we we sort of built out um, really rapidly in terms of suburbs um, and and didn't and and kind of built a city for cars primarily as the mode of transportation without thinking about what's the sort of core transportation network um, around that LRT. And I mean, we certainly do have bus services places, but I think um, that that has lots of challenges because there's, there's lots of cars on the road. It's not always faster. Um, and so there, there's no easy answer. I mean, the Green Line is the city of Calgary's biggest infrastructure project that it will ever do. Um, and I think it's just an incredibly important one from an equity perspective. And I think more than anything, what we have to prioritize, we have to depoliticize the green line as much as possible, I think, um, which hasn't always been a successful thing, um, but build this core um, transit spine. Um, and there's always, we're always getting into arguments of whether it should continue to go more north or continue to go more south, as, as opposed to thinking like, what would be the most equitable way to sort of build this core middle? Um, and so I think, uh, you know, definitely costs are rising um, and, and, and you have a council that is going to oversee that. Um, but I think that what I would say to residents is that this is going to be a really long haul. Um, and I think keeping the confidence and, and the enthusiasm around Green Line is, is certainly important as we work out the details. I think I, I don't want us to be a council that sneezes every, like, you know, every time something around Green Line sneezes that we jump 15 feet in the air because um, it is just a project that is going to have um, you know, we're going to learn more and more as we go. Um, and and I think that we have to continually reassess uh, where things are at and trying to continue to get the best value. But we actually have a very good team in the Green Line board, uh, have a lot of confidence in, in their ability to deliver this project. Um, and right now, um, that board is is working very diligently and we receive updates. And, and our role is to try and figure out how do we leverage more provincial and federal dollars to ensure that, that the, the project can continue um, past that first phase. Now, this is how bad my memory has been since my surgery on December 2nd. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong here, during that first week of orientation, you released a video of you doing two things. One, taking a bus from your ward downtown to City Hall, and then you driving down to City Hall to see which one was faster, correct? So that wasn't during orientation, that was during the campaign. Oh, during the campaign, I apologize. I, I got to ask the age old question. Do you take public transportation or is there a lot of people in Ward 3 that take public transportation? Because I think there's a lot of people outside of Ward 3 who go, we don't need to build it up because they have cars and they can drive. Do people take public transportation in Ward 3? And if so, during the campaign, did you hear we need to get it done? We, we need this because it would help reduce our climate footprint but also it would be good to be able to jump on a bus and or train and get downtown in a timely fashion. So yes, we're three residents <laughs> taking transit. <laughs> Unequivocally I, they do. Um, and I'm amongst them as well. Um, and ridership in, in the North is really high. Um, and so, and, and I mean, ridership right now is down as a result of COVID and a few other things, but um, you know, I think, I think that that's, that's that's the simple answer is yes of course no um, i appreciate and, that go ahead <laughs> and uh and sort of your your second question i i mean i think i think that residents do fundamentally understand that this is a very long-term project i mean i talked talk to to folks who who um 
you know, are, are just like, I want this project built in my lifetime, you know, because it is going to take a, quite a long time to, to move forward. I mean, there's going to be no ribbon cutting of green line within, within my, my term, um, to put it that in perspective, but that doesn't mean that I don't fully keep that, that foot on the gas pedal in terms of making sure that that project goes forward. And I think that that's some of the challenges that we see around projects that, um, that do span like multiple terms is that, you know, it has to stay on the political agenda. And that's why like, I was very clear with people that I'm supportive of Greenland and would be pushing that project um, because sometimes you can, you can see projects like this become a political football because um, nobody's going to get the, the W for the green line within this term. That's, that's the case, right? Um, um, there's no ribbon cutting for us. So, um, but that's not the point. The point isn't to get the win for yourself as a politician. The point is to get the win for your, your constituents in the long term. And so I think that that's that's always been my perspective on green line and i know um i know that you know i wish i could snap my fingers and have green line to to north point um now but that that's unfortunately just not the reality um you also talked about a regional park this is the priority because uh, over the last two years, we've seen that with the rise of COVID, people weren't able to get outside. People weren't people weren't able to play inside. They'd have to go outside. They'd have to go to a park. I know here in Ward 10, we're on the cusp of Ward 10, Ward 5. People were able to go to a few of the regional parks in our area. Um, getting a, 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 not a, a unique project like a regional park is quite Ward 3 specific. Working with a council who, again, we're looking at the larger picture of the city, how do you get to your fellow councillors and say, okay, while it may not be a priority for you, we need to make it a priority because this is a need and we have seen over the last two years, this is a priority for people to go outside and enjoy the region that or the parks that we have. How do we do that? How do you do that? How do you start that conversation with your fellow councillors? Well, it, it, it hasn't even like gotten to conversations with fellow counselors yet because it's, it's working with city administration to understand where we can put this and how we can make that happen. Oh. The cool thing about Ward 3, I mean, it's both it's both a, a challenge um, and and an opportunity is that if you actually map out Ward 3 in its entirety, almost the bottom half of Ward 3 is full of, of residents and, and, and people, but the upper half is, is largely undeveloped. And so finding space within the ward, there is space. And so it's just about making sure that you can actually utilize that um, and, and put it in a place that both the city is okay with and that residents want it. That's sort of the sweet spot. Um, but uh, we, we're certainly looking into that right now and trying to try to push that. Um, and, and I will say like, you know, as much as, as you have to get your colleagues kind of on side with things and being collaborative is really important. I will say that you're by and large, like despite what the media might say, we, we do want to support each other's initiatives. Um, we do want each other. <laughs> I don't do know what really you're talking want. about, counselor. Like that seems like a so weird idea. People actually working together. So, and, and honestly, I can say like, like across the board, even though I don't agree with all my colleagues on every topic, like I, I they're really trying to do things that they believe are in the best interest of their constituents at the local level. And then there's certainly um, larger level priorities that for the city that are important um, that we all, all push and, and strategically direct. Um, and being a city councilor is really an interesting role because you're both like the board of directors, but also the customer service department. <laughs> um, and so you kind of have to, to strike that right balance um, and be able to continue to push the city in the strategic direction in which um, you think it should go on the basis of what you've heard from from residents and on the basis of what the information says and, and the experts say um, but then also try and deliver um, these things in terms of how we're building ward 3 to be better i mean if you look at how ward 3 some of the older communities are built versus what we're building in, in the more newer areas i mean it's night and day difference which is night and day for whoever is going to be the counselor in the future because um, building a better pedestrian realm is much easier to do when you're developing newer communities as opposed to trying to do it retroactively. And so um, planning things from the beginning um, is always an easier way than trying to retrofit behind. But but we certainly have to do both in my ward. Now, you've spoken about customer service a few times, and we're going to change the, the kind of the mood of the conversation a little bit here just for a few minutes. But you you have learned probably in the last hundred and some odd days that not everyone agrees with you. <laughs> Not everyone agrees with every decision you make. How do you go? How do you how do you continue when you have a very diverse constituency 
where you might have a, as you said, even just look at the homes. There's older homes and there's newer homes. The older homes are looking for certain things and the newer homes are looking for certain things. How do you balance that? How do you balance the need of your constituency against what you believe is right? Because at the end of the day, you're there to represent the people. And at the other end, you've been elected to, they voted for you because of your platform, because of who you are. How do you balance the needs of your constituency against your desire to do what is right for the community as a whole? Totally. Well, I, I think that's a great question. And I think one of the big challenges is that, um, you know, first of all, I, I think where you sit on that spectrum of, of sort of, do you just make the decisions you want or do you do exactly what your constituents ask you? That's actually a really hard thing to do because your constituents don't uniformly ask for one thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, some people are really going to agree with with one particular policy decision um, or and then other people want the exact opposite. So I think being able to, to just do what people want it, and sometimes people write in and say, just do what people want. And, and I have to laugh a little bit because we, we also hear the exact opposite piece. And so that that aspect is, is tricky. I think I, I do my best to do what people would like within the context of the information that's also pr provided um, and the and the expertise that is given of, of what is feasible. Um, because you can ask for for all different kinds of things, but if it's if it's really uh, flies in the face of, of good planning principles, or it flies in the face of um, of what administration is saying, like your colleagues also won't go for it. So, um, you know, I think I think it is a balance. I think my I see my role as as uh, I think there's a huge challenge with with decision making in that there's this asymmetric information problem. As a decision maker, you have so much information, oftentimes, and data points on which to make your decision, um, but the, the public doesn't always have that, and they um, it's your job to give it to them as much as possible. And so, when I make a decision, whether um, whether people agree with it or don't agree with it, I, I'm always open to talking to my constituents. So I, I every single day have time in my calendar where I call people and I talk to them about it. I had talked to people about the climate emergency and, and what I felt like it actually materially meant for them. Um, I talked to people at, about pretty much any decision that I'll make. Um, and um, we, we ask constituents, like, what do you think about different things? Um, we talk to them about their Reno and that, you know, we, we, we read all those emails that come in. Um, and so it's, it's not a, an easy um, balance to walk, but my commitment to people has always been like, I'm going to try and make the best decision for um, you take your oath of office first to the city. So you, um, you can't, you know, do things for your ward at the expense of, of, of the city, um, but uh, really do what I think is in the best interest of, of Calgarians. And, um, and uh, I've always said, <laughs> you know, you're probably not going to agree with every decision I make, um, but I owe it to you to explain why I've made that decision. Um, and hopefully we can kind of move forward from there. And, and I found that people are, are really receptive to that. And I think what what people are actually looking for is not a politician to tell them I'm just going to do everything you want or or that um, I can I can um, you know I, I don't make any mistakes or I don't ever um, you know acknowledge that you might have a point. Um, I sit down and talk to people. You're far more likely to get a, a coffee and a conversation out of me than than a tweet. Um, but that's just the type of uh, politician that I, I've decided to be, and everyone kind of does it a little bit differently. Um, that's what I've noticed, at least. Not every counselor calls constituents every day. Um, that's that's their personal choice. Um, some people door knock throughout throughout the uh, throughout the uh, their yeah, term. Yeah. Others don't. Um, so now, the reason I, I set up that question is to set up this question. Sort of, it's a double question mm -hmm. here. We have seen the rise of people protesting outside of politicians' homes. This is concerning to me, and I think this is concerning to a lot of constituents across this. Uh, uh, a lot of Calgarians, a lot of Albertans, a lot of Canadians that this is happening. Um, one in particular, Councillor Gondek, uh, had a protest outside her own residence. I, I ask this and I ask this to Councillor Penner as well. Do you feel safe in your position as a councillor with the rise of the hate that we are seeing with protests in front of George Tahal's, uh residence, Mayor Gondek? Good question. I mean, and, and you're right to sort of ask it at the individual level, because I think, you know, do I still feel safe? Yes, um, I do. Um, but I, I don't know that everybody does. Um, and I think that um, it is it is an occupational concern in, in this in this role. Like I said to you, you know, you walk down the street and you make a decision. People know that you made that. Um, and so there is those sort of security level concerns. 
um, that I think that some counselors have had to face more than others. I mean, if you look, you know, John Carlo Carr has also had people protest at, at his house and, and so has the mayor. I mean, they also have been on council the longest, um, um, longer, so they're more well known. So I don't know if, if my feelings about that will sort of change over, over time, but I, I really have to say, like, I, we, we want and need our elected officials to feel safe. And I think that as a, as it's in the public interest to ensure that they do, um, because you, you want their decisions to be on the basis of good evidence and information and not on intimidation, because that is the undermining of democracy. And so if you are protesting at people's homes, which I hope that none of, nobody listening is, please don't do that. Um, I, I think that's getting to the opposite of, of what you really want and, and, and what we need as a society. Um, and further to that, I mean, when when the ask came forward to, to should uh, we allow um, for security systems at, at, at City Hall, um, for those who choose to, to take advantage of that, I supported that because I think that that's something as, as virtue of your job, if you're at risk, we've had over the years, unfortunately, um, counselors' houses be spray painted or um, uh, people showing up outside of them. And, and this is a recommendation of corporate security. And unfortunately, it's just the reality of, of being in this role right now. And I certainly hope that that settles down over time and that this isn't just our new reality, um, but we have to keep people safe and, and what they deem to be safe, I think is up to them on the individual level. Now we are about 45 minutes, 50 minutes into this interview and I want to start our wrap up now. And my first question for the wrap up, actually, before I do that, for anyone who's watching this right now, because we do have about 10 people watching from what I can see, um, for anyone who's watching this right now, if you want to ask a question to the counselor, we will try and fit, fit it in uh, later uh, in a few minutes. But I'm going to start my wrap up. Ask questions, type it in, and then I'll ask it. Um, but let's start off with this. Knowing now, if you knew now what you knew when you announced that you were going to run, would you have still ran? Yes. Why? <laughs> because, there's always you know, the follow-up I mean, question <laughs> yeah i mean is it divisive yes um is it unsettling at times yes um but like i said i mean this job is still and it's still cliche but it's still the greatest honor and and you really do have the ability to affect change um and so i i think that you know i'm confident in in my ability to do that i also think that citizens deserve to have a counselor who is is open minded and willing to hear their perspective, even if they don't agree, and I think um, that is the beauty of, of civic level governance and um, the fact that we don't have parties and the fact that uh, you know you can vote with certain counselors one way and then the very next day you don't agree and you vote a different way. There, like that freedom and independence is is really important and it's something that we should fight for. And I, I've had the ability to do that and um, certainly always speak to what I think is, is the right thing and, and try and push for good governance. And I think that those are principles that um, are important. So I'm glad I ran and uh, uh, would we'll do it again. So now I, I, I'm gonna ask this to every counselor because I asked this question uh, as candidates, but I didn't get the opportunity to ask you, but I, I, want, I want you back on in two years time. So your midway term, so I won't bother you until 2023 in October. What do you want to accomplish by your midway term point to ensure that you are a successful counselor, but you are also successful in advocating for the people of your constituents? Yeah, good question. I mean, for certainly I, I, I want us to be, um, to first and foremost, get those communication channels going um, to really understand what people are thinking because, um, and, and as things come up that they are able to raise to raise issues. Um, and that, that has already happened. Um, we've been able to connect the dots on, on various smaller, smaller things. Um, so I, I certainly hope that those channels um, for communication and the town halls and the regular communication piece is, is it well in play. Um, I also think, um, you know, to be able to, to make things safer in Ward 3 is certainly a, a big priority of mine in terms of pedestrian safety. Um, and to promote that play element, I'd say, is the other big thing that I'd really like to like to see. And I mean, how that ends up materializing you know, I don't, I, it would be silly to promise, oh, I'll be back in two years and we'll have a regional park. So many of those things are just absolutely out of your control in terms of, of timing. Um, but that's, that's my commitment on what to push on. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be successful in that. I, I appreciate that. Um, I don't see any questions, so I'll, I'll start my wrap up here, but, um, 
I want to ask the age-old question, Olympics, Olympics, Olympics. We are in the midst of the Olympics, Winter Olympics, as an Olympian yourself, as an Olympian champion, which I found out recently from my husband. The moment the games start, you are considered an Olympic champion for the rest of your life. So as an Olympian cha Olympic champion... As a counselor, so Olympian, Olympian, not Olympian. <laughs> Olympian, sorry, um, I apologize. <laughs> what is the message to our, you. what is your message to the athletes who are doing so well in the Winter Olympics right now? Um, well, honestly, I think I am just so, so proud. And, and I know the years of, of long work that, that it takes. And um, I also just want to thank them because I think that right now, um, especially we need, we need to feel a part of something collective. And I, and that's one of the things that I have always felt, um, that the Olympics is able to do, or just that sport is able to do even outside of the Olympics, um, is, is that it brings people together. Um, and we can celebrate some of these aspects of our shared humanity, because we all know what it's like to win at something sometimes. And we all certainly know what it's like to lose at something. Um, and I think that those very, um, human emotions come out in, in the Olympics and, and, you know, for a brief period of time, we kind of set aside all of the things that are going on in the world and, and we just come together to play. And, you know, I think that that's something that is, is really important. So I've got to ask for my, for, for my own thought process here, what's more nerve wracking election night or getting on that stage in the Olympics and uh, fighting for your country? <laughs> <laughs> unquestionably like the the sport element is is way way more nerve-wracking i mean uh to to put it in perspective i i mean like i said that that performance that singular moment that you need to be on is really there in sport um and so you can sometimes put in all the work and it still just doesn't come together um which is really not so much the case in in campaigns and i think uh you know that's both the beauty of of the sport moment and and the challenge of it so um that's my response um i want to thank you counselor Mian, for doing this this has been awesome um like i said at the beginning of the up, uh, beginning of the interview we would announce how much money we raised for vivo um so with all the donations in i want to thank everyone who did purchase the tickets who came out this episode will be uh <laughs> open for everyone to watch if you weren't able to watch it tonight it'll be open for anyone who bought tickets until the until march where we will be scheduled it for public uh, consumption later on but the money that we raised we sold 29 <laughs> Amazing. Well, first of all, I would have to say thank you so much to everyone who bought a ticket and thank you, uh, Chris, for doing this. And I will match your hundred dollars as well. So we can bump it up to 350 um, because Vivo is, is absolutely amazing and, and deserves that. So um, thank you for everyone who bought a ticket to listen to me speak. Kind of shocking, but appreciated. <laughs> I, I am always shocked when people do things that I put mm -hmm. on. So thank you for even doing this. I, I said it at the beginning of the interview and I said it in our pre-interview, but I appreciate everything you do. Uh, I look forward to sitting down with you in a year and a half's time at, in October 2023 for your two-year mark halfway through your term. I look forward to seeing what you have to accomplish. And like I said, just fix the website and I'll be a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> for, so for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brand, have yourself an excellent rest of your night. And remember, everyone, keep talking, have a conversation like the counselor and I just did, because it does help our democracy, but it also makes us a better community. Thank you so much, guys. Have yourself an excellent night.